Hi, I'm Matt Malkin, and today I want to explain to you Einstein's theory of relativity without equations, without math. This is a fun challenge. I know what you're thinking. You see that picture right there? The great man, one of the great geniuses of humanity. Well, how can we possibly ever have any understanding of something so deep, such a profound theory? I mean, relativity is considered one of the great achievements of the human mind. How can an Astronomy 4 class of non-science majors have any chance of hoping to understand this? But I'm going to try to argue here that you can understand it reasonably well with the basic intuition if you'll just follow along with me and allow me to make one or two assumptions here and the thing that's so great about this if you do follow me and understand this you're going to be understanding how the universe is at a much deeper level. This is much more profound than maybe almost anything else that you've seen in physics before, although there were many other interesting surprises. This one gets really deep because it's about the nature of space and time itself, which we have not really questioned before because we haven't had to, but Einstein did have to. So, a little motivation. Why do we need a better theory of gravity here? What's wrong with the Newton's theory that's worked very well for us in the previous weeks in this course? Problem with Newton's theory is that, well, it le seems to leave out a number of points. For example, we know that the force between two masses is proportional to the product of the masses divided by the distance squared. That's universal gravitation. But we also have encountered from uh, fusion an insight that <clears throat> came from Einstein's special theory of relativity that energy and mass are equivalent. So photons, for example, are energy. They don't have a mass, but they could convert themselves into a different form It's really to, uh, and actually make mass out of it. So mass and energy, really, we now realize are two different forms of the same thing, mass energy. And so why is that left out of Newton's theory of uniform gravitation? He doesn't seem to have anything in there about photons because Isaac was ignoring them. Well, he was interested in that. He didn't know there were photons, but he, they don't have any mass, so he's got nothing to say about it. That seems to be an omission. Shouldn't light actually be affected by gravity the same way normal forms of mass are all universally affected by gravity? So to actually explain it, I'm just going to give you a little bit of the punchline first, but then we'll see how we get there. Einstein's theory of gravity is a completely different way of looking at gravity. Uh, it's no longer the Newtonian concept of, well, here's a mass over here, and here's a mass over here, and there's nothing in between them, and there's this magic gravitational force which is exerted between these objects. Even Newton wasn't entirely comfortable with that because, like, how does that actually happen? There's nothing in between these objects, and but they seem to know about each other being there because they're being pulled towards the other object. Do they always know that? Do they just instantly know that? What if the object just appeared there? Would all the other objects in the universe suddenly know, okay, we better be accelerated in that direction because Newton's uh, theory of gravity tells us that. It's kind of like action at a distance, which uh, makes you uncomfortable. And in fact, it isn't really a good way of looking at it. The sophisticated way, the Einstein way of looking at the theory of gravity is that mass, and this could be energy also, but mass or energy of any object, that could be any object at all, actually distorts space-time around it. And we perceive that distortion as gravity. Okay, so I have need to justify that. I know that's a very uh, radical and crazy claim that uh, Newton would have been probably freaking out a little bit about. All right, so first, I've got to spend like two minutes on Einstein's first, one of his greatest hits. This was earlier in his career, I guess still patent clerk in Geneva. Anyway, um, thinking about 
different observers, how they experience the law of physics to different observers who happen to be in different states of uniform motion. In other words, they have constant velocities with respect to each other, relative to each other. So let's just do the simplest case first, where people are moving along in different frames, or maybe they don't think they're moving in their frame. You're never moving, that's just your frame. But you see other observers moving at constant velocity. That means constant speed and a constant direction with respect to you. And relativity, of course, means, this is obvious, that, and there's many examples in Einstein, you can do this with rockets, okay, they didn't have rockets. In those days, I think he had trains, for example, I was very familiar, and so you could imagine a person on the train platform, they say they're at rest, they're in the rest frame, and in their rest frame, they see a train moving by the station in a, at a constant direction, at a constant speed of uh, 30 miles an hour, or whatever. Now the people on the train, because this motion is relative, in their frame they see, they think that they're sitting still on the train enjoying their drinks or whatever they're doing, and they look out the window and they see all of the people on the platform moving at 30 miles an hour backwards. And they say, oh, those people are moving. Now, of course, it is a gigantic concrete platform, so you know that with respect to the Earth, that's kind of silly. But what if you didn't have all those props? What if you didn't have all of the visual clues about who's actually moving? Uh, Einstein correctly realized that if you're just talking about different frames moving uniformly at a constant velocity, there's no way of deciding who's really at rest and who's really moving. It really is just relative. The only thing that you can decide and agree on, and everybody can agree on this, is, well, there's certainly a difference in motion. Right? Uh, our motion, you know, is uh, heading east at 30 miles an hour compared to those people on that weird platform over there. And they would agree, yep, uh, that train is definitely heading west at 30 miles per hour. But none, none of those people on the train or on the platform could actually prove that they're at rest and the other ones are moving. What do I mean by prove? They could not do any experiment. In fact, they couldn't even measure any law of physics that would prove that they're stationary. Every experiment that they would do would come out the same as if they were doing this experiment on the train, actually. Wow. Okay, I guess that's all right. Yeah, that's not really too weird until you start doing what Einstein started doing, and you start thinking about experiments with very high speeds, including the maximum speed, the speed of light. When you start doing experiments with this, with light, which always travels at the speed of light, you realize that this relativity thing is getting very uncomfortable. Why? Because Einstein said, you know, there's no law of physics that will tell you if you're stationary or not, really. Well, one law of physics that I'm certainly going to take to the bank is the speed of light is you know, 186,000 miles per second, and it's universal constant. Everybody has to always agree that that's the speed of light. It never goes faster, never goes slower than that. It can't go faster or slower. It's light. Well, how would that work, for example, if the source of light is moving, or the receiver of the light is moving with respect to the source of light? Or, you know, two, two different observers, one's moving this way, one's moving this way, they both look at a flash of light, and they look at it travel. Well, I'm telling you that actually Galileo had it wrong. He'd say, well, you just add the velocity of the source of the light, you subtract the velocity of the receiver of light, and you just add that to the speed of light. Wrong. That won't work. Because then, different. if that were true, if Galileo's uh, old-fashioned idea, and this, this is certainly Newton's idea too, if you could just add those velocities together, then we, could actually, we would actually have different laws of physics, different experimental results, for example, about the speed of light, depending on who was moving and who was stationary. So I actually slipped something in here that's very profound. If you really want to stick with the universality of everything, always, light always traveling 186,000 miles per second, you have to give up the cherished Newtonian notions. For example, the hardest one to give up is simultaneity. 
someone moving in a different frame will not see events happening at exactly the same time, sometimes not even in exactly the same sequence as somebody in a frame that's moving with respect to that person. You only really notice that when the motions are fast. But um, we're not going to get to that. That is fascinating, but it's not necessary to really understand that for this course. So that's just a historical background. That was a great achievement, and that really already would have made Einstein and a few other physicists around that time working on this, like uh, Lorentz, uh, super famous. Einstein you know, could have gotten a Nobel Prize for that. He didn't, actually, but certainly was worthy of that, but he realized that was just a limited theory because that was only talking about a very special case of motion, which is a constant speed and a constant direction, uniform motion. What about the laws of physics to people, for example, who are accelerating, constantly changing their velocity? That's a more difficult problem in general. Yeah, that's the challenge, that's the problem of general relativity. And Einstein figured, okay, well, I knocked off the simple case of constant velocities. Now, maybe I can look at constantly changing velocities. That means a constant acceleration. And, you know, publish another series of papers. Maybe they'll give me the Nobel Prize this time. Maybe it'll lead to something good. And he went off and started working that. And said, OMG, or oh mein Gott, this is way more complicated and weird than even special relativity was, which already was very weird. I'm going to have to trash some more cherished, intuitive notions about space and time that uh, really have not been questioned since the time of Newton. All right, so first let's think about a uniform acceleration. Uh, is that all relative? By the way, so much baloney is often said from people who haven't thought about Einstein and uh, relativity. The first reaction is, I'll never understand that. He's just a genius. Forget it. That's a wrong reaction. Second reaction is to just sort of uh, get uh, very sloppy. Well, Einstein really showed everything is relative, so it's like it's all relative. There's no truth. There's no reality. Whatever. Get a grip on yourself, all right? That's just a bunch of philosophical nonsense. Uh, Einstein didn't say everything is relative and so on. In particular, I'm going to take this example. If you're accelerating uniformly, for example, at 1g, it's little g, that's 9.8 meters per second squared, that's what the acceleration is due to the Earth's surface gravity here, everybody's going to agree on what that acceleration is. It doesn't matter, well, everybody who's moving at uniform speeds would agree. So, um, you could have somebody moving sideways and they watch you and you're accelerating um, someone moving up, someone's moving down. They'll all agree that your vo they might disagree on what your velocity is because that depends on which way their where velocity is. But they're all going to agree on how your velocity is changing over time. So this is something pretty fundamental. For I just I got a little drawing here of it. This is a sort of a, a dopey, but there it is. So here, it looks like all of these experiments are going to be you and another brave astronaut in a weirdly round spacecraft with little jets on it and a nice big window to view each other. So let's suppose we're in outer space here, for example, and there's no gravity at the moment, but you have rockets and Jackie doesn't. So you get tired of hanging out with Jackie, you start firing your rockets at a steady thrust, a steady force that gives your rocket with you in it a steady increase in your velocity of 9.8 meters per second every second. So you're definitely picking up 9.8 meters per second. It looks like this is in the up direction every second here. And you would feel it. There'd be really no question you're accelerating. Why? Because you'd actually feel a 1G force on your feet. If you're standing up like this on the floor, it would actually feel a lot like Earth. Ooh, which is an interesting hint to where we're going with this. We're not just going up in space here. I wonder if you could tell the difference. Now, from Jackie's frame, her rest point of view, she doesn't have any rockets here. She's just sitting here, lost in space. I'm feeling sorry for Jackie. Anyway, what in her frame, uh, she sees you accelerating away, but in your frame, which is at rest, 
it's an accelerating frame, you see Jackie receding from you at an ever faster and faster rate. Every second she's moving an additional 9.8 meters per second faster away from you than she was a second before. And, uh, but you both would agree that there's some acceleration happening there. Um, you can't make it go away with a uniform motion. You claim that she's accelerating from you. Uh, uh, you could actually settle this, though. <laughs> You're, you're feeling the force in your feet. You're actually feeling the acceleration force. Jackie, being in outer space there with no acceleration, is just floating around in her spacecraft, right? She's not stuck to, to anything at all. So that would settle it. Okay. Jackie, not accelerating. Me, with the, the force, I'm going to feel it in my feet. I can drop stuff on the floor here, and they'll accelerate down to the floor here. If I have a, a loose pen or something, I can drop it to the floor here, and it'll fall at 1G, 9.8 meters per second per second. So no doubt that I'm accelerating and she's not. We can tell the difference there. We can tell who's right. So now, this is the one not obvious thing. It seems kind of simple, so I'm just going to say it here. This is really the basis, the foundation of this lecture, which is why the lecture is about the equivalence principle. What's equivalent? It's all equivalent. No, no, no. It's a very specific thing, and you, I bet you never thought about it before. I don't even have the formulas written down. What were the two beautiful formulas of Newton that really made him famous? I'd say Newton's second law is super famous, and then, what's that, F equals MA. In other words, or I really, my way of, I like that law to be A equals F over M. In other words, M, the mass of an object, is how it resists being accelerated. It's the inertia of the object. You push on it, but if it has a lot of mass, you do not get it to accelerate very much. It resists having its velocity changed. That's what, F, that's what M means, and F equals MA. But there's another formula that actually tries to, where Newton tries to tell you what the force of gravity is. Remember, that force says F equals M times big M times G divided by distance squared. So that's a different property of mass. The first property of mass in his second law is the resistance of mass to not wanting to change its velocity, its inertia. The second property that Newton also discovered correctly, wrote it down pretty correctly there, is the tendency, the characteristic of mass, to generate gravitational attraction of, of all other masses. Two different ideas, and you know, we're so brainwashed by that, you're just sort of floating by in Astro 4, you see the formulas, you see the M, you think M, M, it's a mass, I think we know what that is. We got some insight in this course about what M is, but I never really answered the fundamental question, which was just assumed by everybody, that little M was the same in both of those equations. I didn't question it, did I? But it's actually a fundamental issue, and I'll just tell you the answer right now. The principle of equivalence just states the little m in F equals ma, which is inertia, is the same. It's exactly the same as the little m, which is the source of gravity, in F equals little m times big M times g over d squared gravitational mass, which we call little m, is actually the same as inertial mass, which we call little m, and so we give them the same letter. In fact, they're so much exactly the same that some extremely careful experiments have been conducted to try to see if there was even a little bit of difference between those two masses. And these are complicated experiments to do. In one case, you look at how something responds to being pushed on. In another case, you look at gravity, and you see if there's any slight subtle difference, and there is not. So to incredible precision, I don't know, parts in a trillion or more, I don't know how good the experiments are, nobody's ever found any difference between inertial mass and gravitational mass. But that has a crazy implication, which is not a crazy, I mean, it's sort of intuitive here. Let me, let me run this by you then. I, I say what it is right here in the sentence. I'll tell you the sentence, and then I'll give you the application to see if this sentence makes sense to you. Because the principle of equivalence is true, because 
Inertial mass is identical, not just similar or sort of a little different, but totally exactly identical to gravitational mass. Whenever there's an effect of gravity on something here, you cannot tell the difference between that and a local acceleration. I'm going to say that again. If you're accelerating, all measurements that you could make, all the laws of physics would come out the same as if you were experiencing a gravitational attraction instead. Let me give you a specific example. This is a fun one. All right, I realize this requires a little bit of imagination to do this. Like a number of Einstein's uh, theories, you have to do some thought experiments. But I mean, suppose it was a real experiment. This would be so much fun. Uh, my, one of my things I would really like to do, uh, we could do it with some people in Astro 4. I've actually already got a few people in mind who are kind of into sort of fun practical jokes. This is the practical joke to end all practical jokes. We get somebody in Astronomy 4, and um, somehow we get them into a closed room. Oh, I look, this is nice. There's a little chair there and a lamppost to make them feel like it's a normal room. And then we give them a whole bunch of physics experimental gear so they can measure all the laws of physics in their room. For example, they can drop balls and ma make a careful time and position measurements to see that uh, dropping a ball to the it falls straight to the floor and it picks up 9.8 meters per second every second on its way down to the floor. So they've measured G. They could throw balls sideways. This is getting a little boring. Well, you are just trapped in a closed room there. No windows in this room. And you'd see that the, uh, the arc of these projectiles is a parabola described by the basic laws of Newtonian physics. You could go over, if we put a scale on here, you'd measure your weight. You haven't eaten anything here, so you're pretty much weighing the same thing as before you were trapped in this closed room. Everything seems normal. You're just in this weird room that doesn't have any doors or windows in it. Everything is okay. Now here's my fun practical joke question. How do you really know that you're sitting on the surface of the earth. What if we played a, let's suppose that you were unconscious for like several hours here. This is the tricky part. We might have to uh, induce a state of unconsciousness there. Actually, for some of you guys, it could just be, you know, too much partying, um, maybe some, some abuse of some substances or whatever. But anyway, some of you guys just do this on your own anyway. I was thinking a little bit of, of PJ here because he loves a practical joke here. So don't ask how this happens, but you know, people are partying, whatever. It's like an Astro 4 party. And then PJ is kind of out of it for a few hours. He wakes up and he's in this closed room sitting there a little bit, oh man, hungover, whatever. And there's a lamp there, there's a chair there. Everything seems normal. Although, again, this room has no doors, no windows. But it does have a bunch of physics gear in there. So PJ starts playing with this he's a very curious person and starts measuring the acceleration of falling objects, the, the parabolic trajectories of projectiles. He measures his weight and so on. And... Everything seems like he's in a gravitational field of 1g equals 9.8 meters per second squared. Everything is great. Here's the practical joke that we did. While, while BJ was passed out, we got him on a rocket ship, which we then launched into deep space. By the time he wakes up, okay, this is a little bit of an engineering challenge. By the time he wakes up, he is far from the Earth. There's this virtually no gravitational fields on him at all. <laughs> what a joke. You can't look out the window and see it's just deep space out there. Uh, but, but his rocket has a very smooth, beautifully steady uh, thrust of the rocket engines. It's perfectly smooth. Uh, not like a Saturn V, which is extremely, ridiculously bumpy. It, things like, it feels like the thing is vibrating itself to pieces, according to people who've ridden that thing. It's a, just a 
riding a giant explosive. This is a much more sophisticated rocket that puts out a uniform acceleration in the upward direction. It's increasing its velocity. It may already be a very high velocity. It's probably now going thousands or tens of thousands of meters per second. But every second, it adds another 9.8 meters per second in that upward direction very steadily. No difference to BJ sitting there in the room. He's got no gravity, but he is in a perfectly uniformly accelerating frame. All of the experiments that he was getting ready to do on the Earth with dropping balls and projectiles and so on come out exactly the same in his deep space spacecraft. Unless he opens the windows or tries to get out of there, he cannot tell the difference. In fact, there is no law of physics that could help him notice the difference between these two situations. That's because math, acceleration and gravity are indistinguishable. Wow. Thinking, well, that's interesting. First of all, he's too nice a guy to do that to. We don't really even have the technology to do that hardly anyway. And why would we go to all that trouble? But there's more here. It gets more serious. Um, what about another situation here? It looks like we're doing this one to Jackie here. So I just said that you couldn't tell the difference between a gravitational force and an acceleration. So this is a very important consequence of that, which is, what if you're weightless? So one, in other words, what does weightless mean? Weightless, does weightless mean that there's, this is a common mistake that people make, does weightless mean that there's no gravitational force on you? No. We're weightless all the time. It's, it's kind of fun. People go to amusement parks or diving boards or trampolines or whatever. People love to be weightless because gravity gets to be a bit of a drag after a while. Of course the Earth's gravity doesn't turn off for around amusement parks. We go into free fall. In other words, we accelerate at 9.8 meters per second per second down in the direction of the gravity so that it cancels out. You can always pick a freely falling frame in which, I don't care how much gravity there is, if you accelerate enough, you can exactly cancel it out and you too can be weightless. It feels weightless. I mean, your stomach sort of feels funny because it's not being pulled down now. You totally feel different inside. If you're carrying stuff around with you, I've done this actually in an amusement park ride, the free fall ride. I was like carrying a coin or something, and I just held it there. And when they drop you, the coin, j briefly, uh, it's hard to make these rides very long, uh, the coin just appeared to be hovering in space in front of me. It, appeared, it was weightless too. And if I had time to do this, I could have given the coin a little push and it would have had a constant velocity moving straight across like that. It would have looked like it was traveling in a straight line at a constant velocity because it would have looked like there was no force on it. Now, I know what you're saying. Yeah, but, the, you know, the amusement park operator, I mean, the people on the ground could see that my coin was obeying a parabolic trajectory. It was actually falling, you know, down towards the earth. Yeah, I get that. But in my frame, it looked like there was no gravitational force. Everything didn't have any forces at all. It looked the same as, as if I were in deep space. Oh, and by the way, this works quite well in the space shuttle, too. Why? Because, uh, sorry, the space station. The space station is in free fall around the Earth's gravity, and so they don't feel any weight there. And if they launch themselves in a straight direction, they will keep going straight at a constant speed and direction, constant velocity, until they hit the other wall there. So they really couldn't do any experiment which could tell the difference between gravity and acceleration. All right, of course... Um, right, so in the, in the case of PJ, we could stick him in a room here, and he could experience weightlessness. Now, he is pretty imaginative. He might think, oh, wow, they finally did it. They got a budget, and they've launched me into deep space. This is cool. If only I could see out the window. Actually, we didn't have the budget for that. All we did is we put PJ in a room with no windows, and we pushed him over the edge of a cliff. Right, so there still is Earth's uh, normal gravitational acceleration downward, but since he's also freely falling with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared, he feels like there's no gravity at all. Of course, this experiment is going to come to a pretty sudden 
halt uh, when he gets to the bottom of the cliff there. Then it will be pretty obvious that that was just a practical joke. Sorry, PJ, about that. But it did illustrate this principle of equivalence, I think, very nicely. All right, now apply this to light. This is where things get really fun. Because I said no experiment is going to tell the difference between gravity and acceleration here. We have to get the same experimental results. Now we've got a fancy rocket ship. We're back in space here. And our rocket is uniformly accelerating upward. There's no gravity. We are light years away from any planets or any stars or whatever, so there's virtually no gravity here. But we have a uniform rocket thrust power that's, let's, I don't know, say it's giving us 9.8 meters per second of additional upward velocity every second. Very good. So you would feel natural walking around that thing just like you do at home. You could walk up and down the stairs here or whatever. Now, here's the fun experiment in my accelerating spacecraft. We've got a, I don't know, uh, this is an open floor plan spacecraft, so we can actually look down to the people in the bottom of the spacecraft, and they can look up to the people on the top floor of the spacecraft, and we can send pulses of light to each other. Maybe that's how we would communicate, for example. So let's see how this works. Jackie wants to send waves, light, pulses of light, to us here, so she sends some pulses of light to us. Now that has to travel up to the top floor here. Here's the point. Normally say, okay, then we receive her message, whatever, no problem. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We're accelerating here and you cannot ignore the brief amount of time it took for her light message to come upstairs to us. It took a split fraction of a second there from the time the message left her transmitter until later the time we receive it up here. Now, I know I got the lights pretty fast, but in that split small amount of time, maybe it's a nanosecond or whatever, it's very small amount of time, but in that time, we've been accelerating. What does that mean? In that time, compared to when Jackie emitted the light, now we have an additional velocity upward. Little time's passed. So now compared to the time when the light was emitted, by the time the light's received, we're moving away from it. We're receding from it by, you know, it depends on how strong the acceleration is. If we're accelerating crazily strong here, we might be moving a substantial speed away from the light when we receive it. And we already know what the effect of that is. We've been through that in this class. What happens when you receive a source of anything, electromagnetic waves, and you're receding from it? You know what happens. Doppler shift happens, right? The uh, peaks of the wave get stretched out as they catch up to us, our receding receiver. And so we'll notice several things simultaneously. We'll notice that the wavelength is red shifted. It's longer. It's not the wavelength that Jackie sent it at. It's at a slightly longer wavelength that we have to tune to receive it. The frequency, this is important, the frequency of these waves or pulses, they're it could be photons, flashes of light, or they could be peaks in the electric field, for example. The frequency that we're receiving these peaks goes down because the next peak has to catch up a little more to us, and then the next peak has to catch up some more, and so on. That's all the Doppler shift. But now I want to take this a little further. The Doppler shift, of course, you're using the, a, a very well-known frequency and you're measuring a very well-known frequency. Jackie's measuring that frequency that she transmits. We're measuring, let's say very precisely, say we get compulsive about this, and we measure very precisely the frequency, it's supposed to be the same frequency, that we're receiving it and we disagree about the result. By the way, same thing is going to happen. Uh, we're going to have the same problem if I send a message down to her. What happens then? Can you see? I send a message. I, you know, it's with a very stable uh, frequency transmitter. In fact, it could be with the same frequency transmitter that Jackie was using. You know, she just uh, sent it upstairs to me. Now I send her some messages back to me at the same frequency she sent to me. But what happens? It takes a little bit of time for the messages to travel downstairs 
By the time that they reach Jackie downstairs, she's been accelerating. The floor is now coming towards us a little bit faster than it was when we sent the messages. So Jackie's frame now, because it's accelerating upward towards the light rays, towards the message, is going to experience a Doppler shift also. What kind of Doppler shift? Wish I could hear you say this. A blue shift! Because she's moving towards the source of the waves now. It's the opposite of the first experiment when, when you upstairs was moving away and experienced a red shift. See, you experience a blue shift. It's going to be the same shift if you guys are accelerating the same. So we both agree mm -mm, there's something going on here. Basically, we're always... <laughs> We're always, when we look down to Jackie, we're always getting a lower frequency. When she looks up to us, she's always getting a higher frequency. It doesn't really matter what transmitter or what frequency you do. We both agree about the difference, but there's this shift. Now is where it gets deep. This is maybe one of the deepest parts of the lecture here. This is the deepest part. Anything you could measure about anything happening in Jackie's world down there as she walks around down here, she could send you light or whatever at any frequency, anything you measure when we're up here is going to show this redshift. In fact, that's, how, that's one way, a very good way, that you could accurately measure time. So this redshift that won't go away is a time shift. We look down there at Jackie and we see time appears to be passing more slowly for Jackie than it is for us, as measured by anything, as photons, frequencies, messages, as measured by any measurement that we want to make with us up here. Um, and Jackie can send us information, whatever she wants to send us. But whatever she sends us, it seems to be slowed down compared to what we know it should be. She says the opposite, by the way. She looks up here, and she's looking at us doing things here, sending messages down, and they all appear to be have the same blue shift. Everything, but that means time. She looks up there and says, geez, time seems to be running faster up there. Clocks! Very accurate clocks appear to be running faster in the upstairs compared to my basement clocks here. We could go to the middle of the spacecraft and synchronize our bloody clocks, you know. They're exactly running at the same. Precisely, I want like atomic accuracy clocks. These are the most accurate clocks made by humans. They're ridiculously accurate. Then we take the synchronized clock up here. We take them back here. We stay up there for a week or so. We bring the clocks back. They're not going to agree. Jackie's clock will not have recorded as much time. In fact, Jackie won't have aged as much as we will have. We're actually disagreeing about the rate of passage of time, which shouldn't shock you too much because that already was one of the results of special relativity, that even if you try to synchronize everything perfectly, at one moment you can have everything synchronized, but time will not run at some constant, uniform, divine rate everywhere for all observers. No, wrong. Observers, for example, who are accelerated with respect to each other will measure time passing at different rates. They will age at slightly different rates. These are all very small effects, by the way, because it'd be pretty hard to withstand the kind of acceleration where the redshift would be, you know, really strong enough that you could actually measure it easily. But with extremely precise measurements, it was possible to measure this in 1970. So it's very accurate measurements of frequencies. So now, Here's where the fun starts. How would we measure? It was not measured in outer space. It was measured in a building on the surface of the Earth. No acceleration at all. The building was sitting there in Earth's gravitational field. There was uh, some people in the upstairs, and there were some people in the basement. It's actually my old physics building, and they actually drilled holes through all the floors. It's like a four-story building. And so they could shine very precise frequency of light. It maybe it was a laser light. Uh, between the ceiling, I think it was between the roof and the basement here and back. And they knew exactly what frequency they were sending. By the time, uh, well, if you launch the laser from the basement, 
By the time it was received up on the roof, what do you think had happened? The same thing that happened here in space, because it's 1g of acceleration in space, it's 1g of gravity uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Same thing. Principal equivalent says you're going to get all the same laws of physics and all the experimental results. So the experiment had to come out the same, and it did. The waves, the photons, by the time they reached the ceiling here, were indeed redshifted slightly compared to what they were transmitted at from the basement. So once again, we were straight up with the fact that time, in fact, by any way you want to measure it, passes slightly more slowly to people in a strong gravitational field compared to people that are further away from a strong gravitational field. Strong gravitational field slows time down. And the only reason that you're not aware of this and maybe never heard of this is before, because in your daily life, the gravitational field differences, even if you go up to the top of a skyscraper and then you go down to the basement, there's such a small acceleration, the Earth's gravity is so weak, you could not measure this except with extremely precise precision instruments, these time differences. There have been experiments where they took atomic clocks and one of them was flown on a high-flying airplane. So it's 40,000 feet above the surface of the Earth for a few weeks. They synchronized it with a clock on the ground. After a few weeks of flying around, racking up God knows how many frequent flyer miles, they checked the clocks. And the one, of course, that had been flying at high altitudes for a week or two it had gone faster. It was ahead now of the clock that was earthbound, that was going slower. So this is a real effect. It's called the gravitational redshift. But I hope if you see this, I didn't do an equation here. I didn't do anything except assume that you trusted me, that you believe me, that there is something called the principle of equivalence. Then we're good. So, and now I got one more thing that's even going to boggle your mind even more. All right, so this is what I just said here. By the way, uh, so it's a very small effect on the surface of the Earth, but it's been measured in you know, the last 50 years. It's not such a small effect where there's a really strong surface gravity. In fact, I think it may have been first measured. The gravitational redshift on the surface of white dwarfs is substantial. They have such a strong surface gravity that the absorption lines on a white dwarf are somewhat redshifted compared to what we know they should be, compared to what those frequencies, you know, it's just atomic physics of hydrogen and things like that. We know what those wavelengths should be in a laboratory. We know what they must have been when those photons left the surface of the white dwarf. But by the time they climb out of the strong gravity of the white dwarf, it's like they're losing some energy and they're slowing down. And that's been confirmed. That's been confirmed even for a longer time. So this really works this way. Strong gravity means time moves more slowly. Now here's a more subtle one, but this is pretty important too. So I'm already messing with your probably comfortable, intuitive, Newtonian view of time. Newtonian, uh, it's, Newton thought, well, just there, we could all just agree, you know, set our clocks with perfect watches, synchronize it, and we'd never have to worry about time passing at different rates anywhere in the universe. Wrong? Wrong. Sorry, no. That's just not, not going to work anymore. What about space? Because, I mean, of course, we use light rays to sort of triangulate space. Don't we use light rays to, like, tell us what a straight line is? Light rays are the shortest distance between two points. That's what a straight line is. We already found out that a strong acceleration is going to distort that. What about a straight line, then? Or how would you do that? Go back to my rocket ship here. Okay, this doesn't have all of the windows drawn in here. A little bit more complicated. So, huh, you need a little bit of help from a brave volunteer. What you do is, you. I should put a drawing here. You have a friendly astronaut in space who's just waiting right there. And we uh, drill, uh, we stick in and install a window in our spacecraft. Just at the moment that we zoom by, 
being careful not to run over the astronaut. The astronaut sends a perpendicular pulse of light, or a few pulses of light, from their you know flashlight or flash tube or whatever they're using, uh, perpendicularly into our spacecraft through the window. So it travels across the window here. It's going across in our spacecraft. Now we can all see it, see the pulses of light coming across our spacecraft. Now what happens? Uh, it takes, I don't know, a nanosecond. It takes a split second. It takes a finite amount of time to get to the other side of the spacecraft, to get to the far wall of the spacecraft. But what has happened in the meantime, because our spacecraft is rapidly accelerating with these powerful rocket engines exerting a constant powerful force, by the time this wall of the spacecraft receives the light, the light came in straight, horizontal here, but by the time the light gets over to the right-hand wall, that wall now has picked up a sideways velocity with respect to the wall. Now, I haven't uh, derived this in class, but if you're moving sideways with respect to a source of light, the angle that the light comes to you bends. It's called aberration of light. It sort of intuitively makes sense. It's a little bit like rainfall, right? If you're moving sideways from the rain, then the, the rain particles will you know, appear to be coming towards you, away from you. So anyway, the path that you actually see inside your spacecraft is the light ray comes in sort of straight here, and it curves down like that. See? It curves down, kind of like a parabola. This is a small effect unless your spacecraft is accelerating like crazy so that this short instant of time uh, results in a very large velocity uh, at, the, uh, at the right wall here. But if it's a large velocity, it looks like that photon path is falling. Looks a little bit like a parabola there falling. My God, here's where it gets really deep. Same effect has to happen with no rocket ship, with no acceleration, only gravity. Again, it's a very small effect on the surface of the Earth. I don't think it's actually been observed yet on the surface of the Earth. But it's a pr clear prediction from Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, which is a new way of looking at gravity, that a light ray traveling initially horizontal in the gravitational field of the Earth will gradually, it's traveling the speed of light here, it'll gradually fall down a little bit. It'll be deflected down towards the Earth's gravity. So not only do, light, do photons lose energy as they climb away from the gravity, but they also tend to fall, again, I'm grossly exaggerating, these are very small angles, they tend to fall towards the source of gravity. Now here's where it gets really deep. The path of a light ray is what you mean by a straight line. It's a short distance between two points. There's no other way that I can think of to define what a straight line is. OMG. So the nature of space, what you call a straight line, and the nature of time, what you call the, the progressive ticking of clocks or whatever, are both distorted, changed by the presence of an acceleration or the presence of a gravitational field. That, it's, that's the essence of Einstein's theory of general relativity. You can see why that utterly blew people's minds. It blew Einstein's mind completely, and in fact, he was not really prepared to accept it without observational tests, actually. Uh, he wasn't going to tell anybody really about this theory. It was, it's very complicated mathematically because geometry, you know, the most fundamental laws of physics are distorted by gravity. That was something that Newton never, never considered messing with. All right, so it's a geometric view that both space and time are distorted by gravity. So now we see it's not really an action at a distance. The space gets distorted whenever there's mass there. And the other masses respond by moving around in the curved, distorted space. It's not like they're sending messages between each other. It's just that mass warps or distorts space and time, and then our other objects have to move in this distorted or warped space and time. 
So, and there's an analogy that you've seen a million times that with no gravity and no mass present space is sort of like a uniform flat rubber sheet. We call it flat space time. But if you put a heavy mass on it, particularly close to the mass, uh, it will distort the space and the time, and therefore it will distort the paths in which other masses travel around there. All right, so how can we, I'll show you that analogy in a second. How can we test this? One conclusion is that when you get close to a large mass, gravity gets a little bit stronger, basically because of the distortion of space and time. It looks to Newton, like gravity has gone up a little bit more, just ever so slightly more than the inverse square law of gravity. It has a little bit of an inverse cube term. You don't need to know the math of this. It's really a mess going on. So if you watch an object which spends a good bit of its time a long distance away from the gravity, such as Mercury, but then it has a closest approach to the sun where it passes closer, this will produce an effect which Newton absolutely explicitly did not predict here. Because Newton's law of gravity, the inverse square law, is no longer valid, Mercury's ellipse, it does still go around an ellipse because it's mostly an inverse square law force. Okay, that's just Newton explaining what Kepler's first law here. There's the sun at one focus. I've exaggerated this ellipse a little bit for dramatic purposes here. It looks like more like a comet orbit. But this ellipse processes around a little bit every turn. So it's, it doesn't stay fixed in one direction in the sky like this. Einstein worked out how much that precession would be. Well, even the sun's gravity on the surface isn't that high. It writes 30 times the Earth's gravity. Mercury never really gets that close to the sun's surface anyway. This is a very small effect, a very subtle deviation. But guess what? Astronomers, when astronomy was rather boring, like in the 19th century, spent a great deal of time measuring over and over again Mercury's orbit. And they already knew that Mercury's ellipse is processing and they had no flipping idea why. So they had this mystery, there must be something wrong with Newton's laws of gravity or something else, because it's not staying on the same ellipse. It's processing around. Einstein came along, I don't know if he even knew about this, but then he had to go check up on it. He had a prediction. His prediction exactly agreed with the astronomer's observation of the precession of Mercury, and he describes this. Um, he was just in some kind of transcendental high state for like a whole night when he real realized this. You have to imagine uh, a human imagination having flown that high and then seeing that this is the actual reality completely confirmed. He knew, he knew he was right. He knew this whole crazy theory about gravity actually being a distortion of space and time was right and that he had just basically uh, one-upped Newton, right? He superseded Newton. He was replacing Newton with a more precisely correct theory of gravity, especially when gravity is strong. Now, he published this and so on, but of course I do have to point out he already knew the answer. He could look it up in a textbook that the astronomers had measured this precession, so it's not exact. It's more like a post-diction, right? You come up with a theory later on that explains an observed known fact that was not accounted for before. But you really want to do science very well. The sine qua non, or whatever that Latin thing is, that really is the greatest success of a scientific theory is what? That you can think up a new experiment that nobody has yet done, so they don't know what the results are, and you can predict the answer. You predict a different answer from what Newton predicted with your new theory, and your new theory is confirmed, and the old theory is goes into the trash can. That is the heart of science. So Einstein was pretty obsessed about this, as you can imagine. Where am I going to get a strong enough gravity, for example, that I can directly measure the deflection of light rays? He, it, too weak on the surface of the Earth. They just don't curve enough that anybody could ever measure it. 
It's not like that. It's just, it's so close to straight, you couldn't do it. Um, well, the only really strong gravity that knew, that Einstein knew about, you know, that's accessible uh, nearby here was the sun's surface gravity, 30 times stronger than the Earth's gravity. And he worked out that, yes, if you passed a light ray right along, skimming along above the surface of the sun, it would be deflected. It would fall down towards the sun, that's the center of gravity, by, what is it, I think it's about three quarters of one second of arc and how does this work? A degree is divided up into 60 minutes of arc and then one minute of arc is divided into 60 seconds of arc so that's 3600 seconds of arc in one degree so Einstein was looking for something like less than one four thousandth of one degree Ooh, okay, but he heard that astronomers could make very accurate angular measurements. All they had to do was do an experiment, shine some light along the surface of the sun. Very nice. Thank you, Albert. How the heck are we going to do that experiment? Do you have any practical idea for how difficult it is? It reminds me of a, a press conference they had a number of years ago. Uh, let's just say it was at USC. <laughs> trying to think of somebody to insult here. And they said, we're announcing now a bold new initiative. Our brave USC astronauts will be the first humans to ever land on the surface of the sun. It reminds me of one of those uh, hypothetical problems we worked out in the first week of this course, a gravity problem. And, you know, the usual reporter in the room says, aren't you a little bit worried about, you know, your astronauts getting vaporized when they get there? Like, what are your plans about that? And, of course, the USC guy says, Hey, you think we're idiots? This is USC. We've timed the entire mission. It's all planned. We took that into account. The complete visit and the return is all going to be done at night. Anyway, that's kind of what Einstein did here, actually. How do you do that? He had a kind of the same problem here. How am I going... His, his idea was sound. I just need somebody to send me a light ray that just glances right close to the surface of the sun, and then I'll measure how much it was deflected from what it would have been if the sun wasn't there. And I've got the perfect sources of light. Astronomers study them all the time. They're stars. You know, they're stars in all directions of the sky, so all I need to do is to pick whatever random stars happen to be uh, there behind the sun, but, you know, that are sending light that passes very close to the sun, and I'll just see if they're deflected a little bit when the sun is there. Albert, get a grip here. The sun, it's daylight. It's ridiculously bright. How the heck? You can't see any stars at all in the daytime. Well, maybe one or two, but especially not when they're right next to the sun. You're crazy. You know, that's a typical theorist for you, actually. But what was Albert's response there? It was much better than the USC guys. How did they do it? He said, there is one time you can do this. We need to turn off the sun temporarily. We need to block out the sunlight, and then you can see stars during the daytime, during a total solar eclipse. If the moon will just move right in front of the sun and block all that light out, we'll t for a few minutes, maybe three, four, five minutes, we'll be able to take photographs of stars that are behind the sun sending their light towards us, and we'll see if their positions are slightly shifted by less than one arc second of angle away from the sun because the light did not travel on straight paths, it traveled on curved trajectories going by the sun. So here's a, an attempt to draw this with the rubber sheet analogy. There's your sun there, there's the earth further away, the sun's the big heavy mass here. It you, you, Space, and you can think of it as a distorted rubber sheet, it's all pulled down, mostly near the surface of the sun here. So when the sun was not there, uh, the star was uh, just sending light pretty much straight to the Earth. See, this is star B. It was going straight to the Earth. However, when the sun was there, this is getting ready for the eclipse, and the sun gets blocked at an eclipse, the light actually comes from here and curves around to the Earth. So if you extrapolate this straight, it's not a straight line anymore. If you extrapolate back, the position of the star has shifted 
as a result of its curved path, as a result of the sun's gravity distorting the space near the surface of the sun. So they had to wait until the next uh, total eclipse of the sun was coming up. It was in a fairly exotic locale in the tropics there. A bunch of astronomers took their best telescopes and their best photographic plates. They practiced all of this stuff. They only had five minutes to get it right. And a bunch of photographic plates were taken and then they managed to get it. There were a few reasonably bright stars that could be seen during the eclipse, and it was not a terribly accurate measurement, I have to say, but it did appear that the positions of the stars were shifted because their light paths had deflected. It was consistent with Einstein's theory. Now, since everybody loved Einstein's theory because it was so mathematically elegant, so beautiful. They really wanted it to be true. Basically, they pretty much immediately proclaimed, Einstein has a new view of the universe. The heavens are askew. That's the headline of the New York Times and so on. Nobody knew who the heck Einstein was. Nobody understood this theory except that Einstein was like the international celebrity smartest human being ever. And this pretty much stuck with him for the rest of his life there. Even though like People couldn't even tell you what it was that his theory had predicted, actually. There's a quote about that. I think uh, Arthur Eddington, remember him? He was in on this, you know, organizing the expedition and so on. He was the, the big shot guy. And so he was the one that did all the talking to the press, naturally. And he said, the reporter said, well, you know, Sir Eddington, we're still trying to explain to our reader, like, what is it you guys have actually detected here, you haven't really explained it very clearly to our readers, um, you know, it's said, really, some people say that, that this theory of general relativity, which is insanely mathematical, I mean, it, it, you know, it's like 32 simultaneous differential equations to describe space and time, nonlinear differential equations, holy crud, that are almost impossible to solve, it's said that only three people in the world really even understand what that theory is. So Eddington is supposed to have said, yeah, who's the third guy? PJ, I'm sure, would like that joke there. Anyway, it still is pretty hard to understand, although there's certainly more than just Einstein and Eddington who understand it because it's ridiculously useful now. These effects, the gravitational redshift, the gravitational distortion of the paths of light rays, the distortion of what we say are straight lines, the distortion of space and distortion of time, are used every day by the GPS satellite location system. They must have general relativity being true. They're a test, a confirmation of it every single second because without it, they would get the locations of cars and all sorts of things off by hundreds of feet compared to, they usually can get them pretty accurate. They use the gravitational effects of Earth. They include it very accurately to get to work. So there's no question that this stuff works and it's been confirmed in test after test after test overall, you know, a lot of our technology is based on it being true. All right, so look at this, though, this drawing here. Still, you're thinking, well, so light, you know, travels on a curved path. I guess I'm not too worried about it. I was a little bit worried about time traveling, passing at a different rate. I didn't, wasn't too comfy about that. It's worse. It's worse than this. These are straight lines here, like this. What if that's, that's a straight line? according to us. That's how we measure it, because light travels in straight lines. What if we looked at another star over here? That light path would be like this. What if you made a triangle of these stars, and you added up the angles between the three angles of a triangle, from star A to Earth to star B, and so on? You, you can just see these angles are a lot more than adding up to 180 degrees. So the most basic fundamental that we all learned in 10th grade Maybe we want to forget that. These are basically the assumptions of Euclid. The assumptions, the foundations of geometry, were never actually confirmed by Euclid. It was an assumption that the sum of the angles of any triangle, any triangle you want to draw anywhere, must add up to 180 degrees. Now, Einstein says, well, that's wrong, too. I mean, how much more stuff that we thought we knew are you going to trash, Mr. Einstein? You're just trashing everything that we thought. Uh, even the laws of geometry. You go back to Euclid, he just assumes it. Basically, why? 
basically because Euclid, and I'm sure any smart person would have done the same thing, was always assuming that everything he drew, triangles, whatever, was always on a perfectly flat piece of paper, or a flat piece of papyrus, or whatever they used, in which case his laws were pretty accurate. But now we've seen the universe is often not like that, and when there's a lot of gravity, the universe is not even close to being like that. And so now you can see where we're going to go in the next lecture here. Just give me more and more gravity. More gravity in the Earth, more gravity in the surface of the Sun, more gravity in the surface of a white dwarf, where these things were measured. Where did we get to last lecture? The surface gravity of a neutron star, these curves actually become to scale. Light rays really do bend that much, passing close to the insane high surface gravity of a neutron star. And what's to stop them from bending even more if we had something that was more compact, smaller than a neutron star? We could make these light rays go in a circle. And then you would have something unbelievably bizarre. So that's what I wanted to tell you about today. And we'll see where it goes in the next lecture.